I'm trying to uh, hopefully tell a story today, uh, a story of two parts. One is about an economic opportunity, and the other one is about a world view. Now, hopefully, we can get both of these things into one presentation. And um, it's always important, perhaps, to, to establish a little bit of the, the, the common background. And you'll be well aware of this one. This is our uh, economic opportunity at the moment. It seems a linear economy, take, make, and dispose. There is a feedback loop in there, but it's mostly around monetarized uh, goods and services. This has served us very well, if you like the idea that we're surrounded by the products of such a, an approach. But as we've been discussing uh, in, uh, in many fora, this uh, opportunity might be shifting to one where we have a rather different sense of what the economy is. Now, here's the model for the new economy. It's about energy flowing through, it's about material cycling, and uh, it's uh, clearly a representation of the, uh, the, the way the uh, planetary uh, materials uh, flows at work. So that, that's fair enough, and we characterize it as a circular economy where you've got basically two streams. One, uh, technical materials, which would not be uh, gracing the biosphere over much, as little as possible, hopefully none, and the ma biological materials flows which decompose through that system. That's, that's fair enough. That's uh, good to look at. Uh, it's been elaborated in various documents. Uh, here's the, what some people refer to as the butterfly diagram where you've got a, more elab a greater elaboration of all of these, these flows. So this is an identification of an economic opportunity. And uh, that is an important thing to start with. But it is more than that. It's more than an economic opportunity. It's, it's about a way of looking at the world. Because uh, what has changed? This is uh, a view of the world characterized as perhaps Enlightenment 1.0. It is a view of the world which is the world is more like a machine. Uh, it's understandable, predictable, and controllable. Science didn't just give you explanations, it gave you predictions. And you could be confident about science because it could make those uh, predictions based on what it understood, because uh, the relationships were seen as deterministic relationships. Once we figured out the rules, like a market was a way of allocating resources, because it was a mechanism. People still talk about the mechanism of the market, as though this was a rule that was dug out of the scientific Im imperium and uh, presented to be mechanical. But unfortunately, this is not the whole story, as we probably well know. Here's David Hockney and a little sketch. To see the bigger picture is to see more. Has our perspective given us limited vision? Do we focus down too much? The, um, the Enlightenment One science was really about reductionism. Uh, uh, digging down for the details, finding the basic parts, and then building things up. But Hockney's there is talking about uh, an infinity of perceptions if we reverse the view to look outwards. And he even quite cleverly adds the notion of life uh, on the left with an opening of perspectives and death by being too focused down. Hardly a new idea, I have to say. This idea of a continual transformation within the universe, the snake eating its tail, Ouroboros, is a deeply uh, archetypal symbol. It's um, thousands of years old. Uh, but this is essentially about a process within the context. The old adage was at the time, as above, so below. What was happening on Earth was a mirror of what was happening in the broader context, which was the heavens. And the process was one process. This is how, apparently, in one diagram, you can do the the Philosopher's Stone, if you're interested in, in that sort of chemistry. Uh, the, all the clues you need are in here, so study it well and apply later. But um, if it's an ancient idea, <coughs> we don't have to deal with it in an ancient way. Uh, this uh, is a little diagram which suggests that the most of all systems are dynamic. Most of them are ordered complexity. We used to think that most systems were either mechanical, linear, deterministic, or the opposite, entirely random, in which case we deal with it with statistics. But the results of looking at systems with feedback, and we've been able to do this really well since the advent of computers, before then it was a really pretty difficult task. Almost all systems are ordered complexity, and therefore the logic is, surely, if the most of the systems are ordered complexity, and these are special or limited cases, 
That's where our attention, and it's the first time I'll mention education, surely our attention in education should be on understanding ordered complexity above all. Because that is the real world above all. You can't say that we understand the world by understanding the mechanics and the disorder and sort of leave out the middle bit if that is what most systems actually are. Well, of course, it would be a, a, an education system that was teaching the irrelevant to the uninterested, if that was the case. But we, we sort of assume that we have a higher aspiration than teaching that, or helping people learn that. So this is where the action is, folks. We know that. This is not exactly new. It's been around 30, 40 years, this understanding. So you can characterize it perhaps this way. It's a, just another way of looking at it. We're much more comfortable with static visions than we are with dynamic ones. And this is a, perhaps uh, a part of this uncertainty that occurs in the modern world, pretty much. Because on the left-hand side, it gives a promise of certainty. If you can only define the levers and the rules, there's a fantasy on the left that you can control the economy. No, you can't. You can, you can chuck a few things at it and see what happens. You can't control it. The Chancellor doesn't come along and pull the levers on the economy. That's, that's a way, way old fantasy, is the idea. It's much, much the same as we expect scientists, too much of them in a way, we expect them to be able to control things. We're much, having to, much more having to learn that you can influence, you can get involved, but you don't control it. You have to be happy with seeing what the input leads to and then reacting again. Feedback demands a different way of looking at systems, particularly economies. But any dynamic system, which an economy is one, has these characteristics. You're not in charge. There isn't a result, but there is a possibility of getting continuous improvement. How would you know? Well, you can check back to see how it's going. Or a spiral of decline. But it's not going to stand still for you. There's no golden age. There never was. So you needn't think about how disappointed you are that the world isn't as you expected it. We've just got to grow up a bit and realize it's a dynamic world. And um, you can see which way it might be going, but you can't demand anything of it in particular. Now, you're never supposed to use a large amount of text on a presentation, but I've got two chunks here which have enormous parallels. So I thought, I can't put it in a line. So I'm doing it as a chunk of text, and you can look at it there. Ken Robinson, we're in education territory now. He's looking as well, as, as a lot of what we do with the circular economy, at the underlying metaphors. And he says we've got an education system which is really built on Enlightenment 1.0, still. It's still about, as he argues, batch production, conformity, fitting in with something that's easily measurable. But he argues, and he argues very, you know, obviously I like it and a lot of people do. Uh, he argues that this is not the most appropriate process. Partly because science has moved on, he's not making that argument here. But he's saying that you, if you want human flourishing, you ought to be more like agricultural experts or gardeners than you, than you are running a a widget factory. You've not got a sausage machine. We're not making sausages. We're educating. Now, this parallels nicely, I think, with these folks, Nick Hanauer and Eric Louis. I wrote a lovely little book called The Gardens of Democracy. Now, Nick's a, a venture capitalist, and he's bought and sold more firms than most people can write large numbers. Uh, but he is, again, arguing that we are dealing with complex systems, and the metaphor is not a machine metaphor, it's just inappropriate. And his take on it is that if we want to be able to have an, a, a, a democracy that works, you're going to need, actually, I don't know if he says that explicitly, but you're going to need abundance, you're going to need that economic opportunity, scarcity. Uh, somebody once said that, that power resides in the creation and maintenance of scarcity. Democracy needs abundance. It also needs an approach to how we do things, which is more like gardening. Uh, in this very room, a few years ago, uh, a speaker said, you can't encourage a plant to grow by pulling on it. You provide the right conditions, and let's see what happens. Now, if you don't like that plant, you can get rid of it. You can try something else, but you don't. 
shape it physically with very great success. And once you start there, everything looks different. Now I think this is, this is very exciting. On the left, just to reinforce it, here's our more traditional uh, focus on the, the, the education sort of system. We, we tend to value the, um, the left-hand side. But I asked the person doing the graphics to make the right-hand side much bigger. Not to say that we're balancing it. No, 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 that wouldn't be enough. That's a, that's a, a trap. It's not 50-50. Most real-life systems are complex, dynamic systems. Therefore, much, the most of the learning ought to be in this area with a little bit of your analytics, a little bit of your tunneling down to make it complete. As you well know, it's almost all that side and not this side. We don't generally reward people this side. I went to a meeting once and said, I'm a generalist. People looked at me with that look, which means, are you really supposed to be in this meeting? <laughs> so I don't say that anymore. It's true, though. I'm a generalist. And I'm proud of it. I'm not a specialist. Now, this is an old idea. This is the odd thing, you see. And why is it that we've known about these things in education? I think it was Carl Rogers who first created the term participatory learning in about 1965. And there have been many initiatives around system thinking in education. And it, they've, they've got somewhere, but not they're hardly dominant, should we say. Hardly dominant. So I thought, well, let's try and be honest about the schooling system. I'm calling it schooling because I have a particular meaning in mind. And the quote here, I think, uh, tells us something of a cynical take on it, but I think there's some element of truth in it. School systems have always had two primary purposes, and critical thinking isn't one of them. They're not there to encourage critical thinking. If you've ever looked at where schooling came from, it was about nation-building, conformity, fitting people into industry as willing workers and able workers. The, the more thoughtful stuff was reserved for the elite. It always has been. A broad, balanced education with somebody who's going to be a general manager, not somebody who was fitted into a schooling system. And the other thing was that we, we wanted tame citizens, people with a sense of responsibility. So creativity and critical thinking really doesn't work terribly well with that, because these people might want to change something. And if you look at the real world, here's median income, and it's an American example. Is median income of families, and here are college costs. They know, and why are they paying these costs? Because it's an economic imperative. Because we've got jobless growth. Because we've got a real competition for what few long-term, well-paid jobs there are. And that, in a way, reinforces the idea we don't have time to mess around with systems thinking. We don't have to mess around with participatory learning over much because I just want to get the rewards that credentials, the qualifications will give me so that I can access areas where I perhaps can think more broadly and creatively and critically. It's sort of like you have to earn your way into it, which is ridiculous because the whole of the world, as we've seen, is mostly about complex dynamic systems and being able to be a systems thinker would be not something you get as a reward for going through the system, but a way of going through the system, surely. But that may sound a little miserable. And I can see how if you're involved in that, well, you're, un you're in a system. You can't easily buck it. A lot of teachers, and I, I, I was a teacher for many years, a lot of colleagues had always said, well, often the education happens at the edges of what we do. We have to put up with an awful lot. But it makes it rewarding when we can get in there and do something more educational. But this is the promise, you see, and it links to a circular economy. The economic opportunity is changing, and in the, that phrase there, you don't need permission for a revolution. This is the building that holds the Manchester Fab Lab. Uh, the technologies which are doing so much for a circular economy, and a devolved economy, a sharing economy, they're the ones that are going to disrupt education. I don't think educationalists have yet really understood what the potential disruption would be. Just think. You know, for all the talk of MOOCs and, uh, and uh, online learning and all the rest of it, things that we're involved in, I don't think that disruption has really struck home. Because the barriers to entry to be able to learn things from each other, to be able to put things up there for 
support or for critique, the ability to get the tools that enable you to do things and to meet the right people, those access costs are falling and falling. At one time you went to a school because that person in the front was the only one who knew anything that would help you get a movement onwards. It's not true, it's just a wash with information and tools and access. People are going to just do it anyway. And they are doing it anyway. Even Charles Clark, one of uh, the UK's education secretaries some years ago, said most learning takes place outside of school. And it's ever more true now. So you might reserve to Caesar what is Caesar's, which is the path through the traditional way to uh, access uh, credentials and therefore some power. But much more likely is that you will just go ahead and do it yourself. You'll have a great idea and some friends will have a great idea and you'll just go and do it. And here's another example of just going to do it. This is the Global Village construction set. They've set about producing all of these tools. The aim is that they'll be at one-eighth of the cost of buying it commercially. It's open source design. They do the testing. They are made of materials which you can easily repurpose, made out of standard parts as far as possible. Everything you might need to build your own society, highly productive, because the cost is so low. Now this is a group of people just saying, let's do it. Let's learn about how we do these things and let's get on with it. Let's build our own machines. We're not relying on other people to have this revolution. We can build our own version of a circular economy. We can kickstart it ourselves. And I don't know if you've seen the, the, uh, the, the rather clever Fairphone that came out of Holland. This is the idea that a bunch of people decided to raise money and get their own phone built to their own design with better characteristics around disassembly, about repair and all the rest of it, and they went ahead and did it. One of the most complicated things on the planet, they didn't make it, but they designed it. They got it designed. They got it built, they got it funded, and they just did it themselves. So if you like, my message for uh, education and systems thinking is, uh, and the circular economy, the change is happening. The change is happening so rapidly and so profoundly that formal education has a chance to join in, but if it doesn't, people will do an end run right around it and do what they want anyway. Such is the economic opportunity of a circular economy. They will find a way through and they will just do it. You won't be able to stop them. Why would you stop them? I still marvel at classrooms that say you can't bring your iPad, you can't bring your mobile phone to class. What? What, is, what are they thinking about? So if they don't want to get swept away, because these profound technologies are changing the relationships with materials, tools, products, ideas. What, are, what is going to happen if that is unstoppable? And it's good news because it fits in with the economic opportunity of a circular economy. So thank you very much for listening, and it was a great pleasure. Thank you.